Gaming is considered through the lens of what we would call a moral panic. So often wider society is concerned with the amount of time people are spending on gaming. But there are other concerns as well around violence, around sexism and so on, and the representation of women, and whether or not gaming encourages people to be violent. I think video games are fantastic because it provides you a story world that you wouldn't otherwise live in through real life. It poses you challenges, but at the same time, it gives you the tools to solve them. And that can be quite positive to sort of your own sense of well-being and competency as well. I think there will always be war games, first-person shooter games, which is not a problem, as long as there's also cute and friendly save the creature games and work out the puzzle games. When designing games, it's really, really super important to get it right to make it inclusive and make it appropriate. Gaming is still a hyper-masculine space and it's policed by men. The types of games, especially massive online role-playing games, are still policed by men in a way that makes women feel uncomfortable. So we need to deal with sexism in gaming and in the gaming community. In 2020, the global gaming industry was over $187 billion. That makes it larger than any other entertainment industry. Most people in the world have played video games or play video games at some point. I think the video game industry is growing so much because games are such an immersive and compelling medium. It gives me this sense of pure joy. I can really try something that I wouldn't have otherwise tried because I don't have the tools or the venue or the role in society to do. Games where you get to save things, help things and build things, they're really, really powerful for a very diverse range of games players. The global gaming community is a lot more diverse than people probably expect. Obviously you have a lot of younger people playing video games, but then you meet a lot of people that are like in their 50s that have been playing this game for 20 years and you're like, oh wow, okay. It's a really nice way to meet new friends, meet new people and encounter people from all walks of life. The largest group of people who play games are uh, women 40 and up. One of the reasons for that is the transformation in the types of games and the availability of the types of games, including games that are available on your mobile phone and more kind of online desktop role-playing games. I think there's so much potential for learning, fine motor development, for enjoyment. There's nothing wrong with, you know, using games for enjoyment, for escape. I read books, I watch movies, I play games. I work as a registered nurse in the emergency department. I find gaming to be a huge outlet for relaxing, a huge social element to it as well, so most of my mates are gamers. Games have a lot of benefits. It can change people's behaviours. We can design the game to make the world better. One of my projects is called Inside Out. It uses an imaging capsule. We ask the player to swallow the imaging capsule and we designed a wearable screen on the front of their body so they can see their gastrointestine tract in real time. They tried different activities including like eating, drinking and moving their body. By doing so, we want to engage people with their interior body and to get more understanding of their body and to motivate good uh, behaviors. We're trying to reverse engineering uh, some of the key aspects of gaming uh, in order to develop assessment tools and intervention tools that can be more engaging for participants. We wanted to measure impulsivity in the context of online counseling services. We had a number of tasks that we knew were sensitive to different mechanisms contributing to impulsive behavior. And then what we did is working with game developers to try to gamify those tasks and transform them into little games. So the three games that we designed were activities that people would have to do in the Wild West scenario. They allowed us to measure different mechanisms contributing to impulsive behavior. I wanted to create language learning software that didn't suck. My research area is in teaching sign language. And learning languages is really, really hard, 
Games offer a really powerful way of teaching things that's engaging, that keep people wanting to participate in this learning process as opposed to being turned off by it. Games has a lot of benefits. We can use it for education, healthcare and different domains, but we need to acknowledge the dark side as well. The World Health Organization considers that gaming disorder can be classified as a behavioral addiction. Gaming disease and gaming disorder are poor classifications that are most likely symptoms of other mental health struggles and challenges. I would say that binging Netflix for nine hours a day is worse than playing video games because video games are interactive. You're moving with them, you're having to think about strategies and your interactions versus being a couch potato. There's an instinct among, I think, the general population that violence in gaming leads to violence and aggression in people. Actually, the science is very mixed. There's plenty of science published in Nature and the British Medical Journal and so on that tells us there isn't this cast iron relationship. There's a researcher called Brendan Keogh who has argued that certain games are actually really good at using violence to confront the gamer with moral questions. For example, instead of shooting somebody and the body disappears, which is what happens in a lot of games, you actually have to approach the body and see that person as a person and perhaps find their documents, find pictures of family members. You're confronted with the question of whether or not that was the right thing to do. And of course, in military training, gaming quite often is used as a way of teaching empathy, not necessarily teaching violence. I think there's a lot of games now that gives you all kinds of experiences that's beyond a simple action. It also has a sense of character development. You can go and find something that's not just about shooting or killing someone. You can try and accomplish something in a very non-violent way as well. The average game developer is a male. The age range of 20 to 35. The gaming industry in terms of being a player or even an employee is probably an intimidating place for a woman to be sometimes. I've received death threats and a lot of harassment. Harassment in virtual reality can be so much more visceral than other types of online harassment. When someone comes up and attacks you or tries to touch you or yells at you, it feels like someone is truly in your face. And that can make these communities particularly toxic and difficult to find a safe place to enjoy. If we solved harassment in the rest of society, we would not have the problem in gaming. I think gaming just allows an anonymous platform for harassment to occur that's larger than in society because it's often anonymous. There needs to be more characters in gaming that are not sexualized. The way that male designers and male executives think about gaming and women in gaming seems to have changed quite a lot, but it's still not perfect. I think we need to be very clear that there's a lot of work to be done, but there are some male executives, some male designers, and increasingly members of the wider gaming community that push back against sexist tropes and sexist bullying in the gaming community. Diversity among developers is a really important next step for the gaming industry. I actually went to a, a games company a couple of years back and went, you actually need me. Why? Because I'm a female? The game development industry, little by little, is becoming more diverse, but not nearly at the rate that's needed, and certainly not at the rate which game players are becoming more diverse. I think video games uh, need to do better at representing the world in the sense that there's a lot of games that are out there that are being made for a particular crowd or community, but it doesn't go to the community and invite them to co-create and collaborate on that game as well. So as a result, you have video games that are made for a particular audience from people who don't necessarily know what the audience likes or wants. I hope that more and more people are empowered to not only play, but to create video games. I think it's a great way to communicate one's own experience struggles, dreams, and everything else. My hope for the future is that more women, more people of color, more people of different abilities and from different backgrounds feel empowered to make games that highlight their experiences and celebrate their strengths.